Hold more. up, well, we're gonna come out of the tunnel with you here. We're going through, we're, we're hitting some rush hour traffic, but uh, we're, we are going through and we are outside. But we're doing pretty good, Stacy. We are about 2,200 miles into our journey. We got about 4,000 more to go. We were in New York uh, yesterday, today, and now we're headed to Cleveland. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on this amazing effort. Very thank important to raise awareness for men's health. Yeah, and thank you for uh, for, for joining us today. And uh, we're very excited. Yeah, you know Sigil? Sigil's my partner. I will, I will How are you doing? Too. Somebody has to drive, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... You know what's interesting, Stacey, is we've had a lot of people ask us about prostate cancer. And even though we try to talk about general medicine and blood pressure and diabetes, the conversation always goes back to prostate cancer. Because I think when a lot of people think about men's health, they think about prostate cancer. So, you know, our audience, a lot of the, our audience doesn't really know what, even what prostate cancer is. You might just, I know you're a, a leading expert in active surveillance and prostate cancer research. Right. We'll get into that, but what exactly... You know, why is the prostate so important yet not so important? Yeah, well, it sure does cause a lot of trouble, doesn't it? So, well, <laughs> I mean, it is a very common cancer in men, both in the United States and around the world. Um, some men are at higher risk than others, actually. So if you have a family history of someone with prostate cancer, uh, also African-American men have a greater risk. It's just this little organ uh, in the bottom of the pelvis. Um, it's in a bit of a tricky location, unfortunately, kind of high price real estate area. We've got, you know, the rectum and the GI tract just behind it and the bladder just above it and the nerves controlling erections on the side. So that's why there's a lot of issues related to the treatment of prostate cancer because it's in this difficult spot amidst all these other important structures for things like your urinary function and sexual function. But, you know, the good news is that it does have a very pro good prognosis these days, particularly if men get screened early. So early detection really is critical in order to find it at a curable stage because there's just no symptoms. It only causes symptoms once it's very advanced. And many of the early forms may not even require treatment. So it's important for men to know that a diagnosis is not at all a death sentence. There's so many options if you catch it early. So the key is really to just stay on top of your health. Now, you mentioned um, screening guidelines. Like, I myself get confused sometimes. You know, the AUA has one guideline, Europeans have another guideline, and then Americans, uh, the uh, Preventive Task Force says we shouldn't be screening at all. So a lot of my patients come in very confused about what the heck is going on. And, and then when they do get diagnosed, they're like, well, when should my son get this? So okay. in your practice, what, what do you usually, when do you usually start screening and then when do you usually recommend if someone's high risk just to get themselves screened? Yeah, so this is a great point and a huge area of controversy. And definitely, I mean, the most important thing is shared decision making. So you really need to talk to your doctor about screening, hear about the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages are it's the only way to find prostate cancer early. Disadvantages are it's not a perfect test and some prostate cancers are not harmful. But you know, you don't necessarily have to act on the results. And that's what I always tell men, that if you bury your head in the sand, the problem doesn't go away. So what's more important is that you gather information because information is power. So if you know your number, this is a campaign of the AUA, our, our urology organization, know your number. So once you know your number, your PSA number, you can make your own choices if you wanna do anything. You don't have to get a biopsy. If you're diagnosed, you don't have to get treatment. And in some cases, it may be better not to do anything further. But if you just don't know about it, then you're left with no options. So my recommendations are that you should have a baseline test in the early 40s. Okay. And this is even true for men who don't have any risk factors for prostate cancer. Because actually, the baseline PSA measurement in the early 40s is a stronger predictor of developing life-threatening prostate cancer than any of the other risk factors. So um, certainly men who have risk factors are at increased risk of prostate cancer in general and being diagnosed at a younger age. But even if you don't have any risk factors, if that baseline is above one, 
you're at a much higher risk of ever developing prostate cancer or ever dying from it. So why not know that information? And if it's not, if it's below one, then you know you can feel more reassured that if you don't have any other risk factors and that looks good, then you know you could at least forget about that for a few more years. Uh, certainly, regular testing starting at 50 is uh, pretty standard um, as long as you've gone through the conversation with your doctor and decided that this is right for you. Then you know every one to two years, starting at age 50. You know, until the point that you've got a lot of other health concerns and it's really not a factor anymore. So, so I remember one thing is uh, when I was in training, uh, in the beginning of training, everyone got surgery or radiation. And then towards the end of my training, it was like, hold on, you know, you shouldn't be operating on all these people. The term active surveillance started buzzing midway through my training and now is like the it has become almost a standard for a lot of low grade or very low right. grade. What exactly is active surveillance? Because you know, a lot of my patients still have a hard time grasping that they can do this when they know the big C word is inside of them. Right. Well, active surveillance means that you are not going to treat the prostate cancer right now, that it's a, a low risk tumor and it may not cause any harm during your lifetime. So you're just going to watch along, but it's active. You are actually watching and doing testing to make sure that it doesn't get worse. And if it does, then hopefully you're able to then catch it in time to still get treatment with curative intent. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is still active. It's not just, you know, say goodbye to the doctor and forget that it exists. It's, you know, continuing to get the PSA blood test periodic imaging studies, you know, like maybe an MRI um, every one to two years and uh, getting some repeat biopsies to check if the cancer is uh, growing or becoming more aggressive. So, so you would recommend like, see, um, so I've been in practice like now two years. So my active surveilling guys have been coming every, I treat them like as if they've had prostate cancer every three months and every six months and hopefully every year. So would you recommend I get like MRIs like every year or two just to kind of mm -hmm. you know, see if there's anything that I'm missing or any? Exactly. And if, you know, I mean, it can help to decide when they should have another biopsy. So, and you know, it's nice because the MRI technology has really expanded a lot. Um, MRI, you know, many people have had it for their back or some other organ and it really wasn't used much in prostate cancer until the past few years. But now the technology's improved so much that sometimes you can see tumors. And if you can see it, it's more likely that it's a big, nasty one. So it is something that's helpful to get in men who are on active surveillance just as um, an, an image. I mean, it's a picture. And if there is something ugly on there, then that would you know, let you and the patient know that there is a higher risk now that something has propped up that wasn't there uh, at the time that we started this strategy and maybe we need to rethink, you know, should we go forward with some kind of treatment? Should we do another biopsy now and make sure that we put some biopsy needles in that area where we can actually use the MRI to help target the prostate biopsies? So this is kind of an evolution since it's still, you know, a relatively new technology. We do a lot of MRI work here and have a big experience with it, but it has not gotten to the point where it's uh, completely standard everywhere in the country. So I would just say to, you know, the men who are listening, just to make sure that, you know, if you're going to uh, think about prostate MRI, that you go to a place that has a lot of experience with the technology. That's very impressive, Stacy. Can you hear me, Stacy? Yes, I can hear you now. So I know you like to do a lot of research. What is your, uh, what, what, what do you like to do research in? Other than social media, I know you, you, uh, Stacy is a social media guru. She's my idol when it comes to social media. Oh, well, so. that's, you know, I think you're doing an excellent job and, you know, really just a great advocate for men's health. So very, very impressive. Uh, my research is all in prostate cancer. For the past 10 years, I've been doing um, research on prostate cancer screening, 
and really the importance of screening in terms of outcome. We've shown that men who got screening even had better outcomes when they had surgery from prostate cancer. I've done a lot of research on different testing options. There's so much controversy about the PSA test. It's the blood test that's mainly used for prostate cancer, but now there's all kinds of other markers that are available. Uh, one of them that I did some of the work on is called the Prostate Health Index. It's um, an exciting new test that's actually just like a better version of PSA. It's um, a blood test just like PSA, you know, similar price, but it's about three times more specific for prostate cancer. So um, I participated in some of the studies that led to FDA approval of this test. So it's good that we're starting to develop some new options in terms of, you know, other ways that men who are concerned about prostate cancer can think about testing. Um, and then most recently, I've been working on active surveillance research. So these are for men already diagnosed with prostate cancer who want to avoid getting treated, especially if they have low risk disease, what's the best way to monitor their cancer over time and decide when we need treatment? And are we gonna lose anything by waiting? And we have a lot of new data suggesting that, you know, really you're unlikely to lose anything by waiting as long as you're followed closely. So with, you know, in the first 10 years after diagnosis with low risk prostate cancer, you know, the prostate cancer death rate is less than 1%. So that's regardless of whether you have surgery or active surveillance as your initial option. So really, if you have low risk disease, I think that it is definitely a, a good consideration and a good option. And that way it's, you know, much less burden for the patients. But, you know, if it's not low risk, if it's a higher grade tumor, a bigger tumor, you know, going ahead with treatment is the way to save a man's life. So, <laughs> the mail, that's um, your hashtag. Save the mail. <laughs> yeah, save the mail. I mean, truly, because, you know, there. I think what gets lost in this debate about prostate cancer is everyone thinks it's somehow irrelevant or insignificant because there's so much controversy about screening, but it's still the second leading cause of cancer death in men. So if it couldn't be harmful, then, you know, there's no way that it could cause 27,000 deaths a year in this country. So we just have to keep that in mind. And screening is the way to find those people. What we have to do then is just make sure that the other people with the low grade cancers don't face an undue burden of treatment and side effects as a result of this. So as I see it, you know, screening is critical for us. It's our only way to find the life threatening tumor at the time. But meanwhile, we've got to do everything possible, use better screening tests, better newer uh, minimally invasive treatment options, better imaging studies, everything we can do in the process to um, help men through. Now, uh, really quickly, genetic testing. Now, sometimes patients, I tell them they should active surveillance. They're coming in with their oxygen masks. Yeah. They've got their biopsies done elsewhere. They come to me for a second opinion. They're like, do my surgery. And then I just get the genetic testing. And sometimes it's really vague. But when they see that paper that says they're low risk, they believe it more than it coming out of my mouth. So do you see a more active role, a more important role for the test um, when it comes to helping us with um, treatment plans? Well, you know, it's definitely another piece of... Well, I'm not paid by any of those companies, so I'm just saying you guys... Yeah, I mean, it's another piece of information. I think most people come out in the middle uh, where the result doesn't change what you would have suggested otherwise, but there are cases at the extremes where it does change the decision. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot of long-term evidence yet on those. There's definitely evidence showing that those tests change clinical decisions. We don't know whether that was right or wrong. Um, and the tests are pretty expensive at this time. But I think it is exciting that we have other options to try to standardize things, uh, you know, and to just give men more information. And if someone, you know, has a tumor that's kind of borderline, they just can't decide, should I do active surveillance or not? Could we have, you know, missed some higher grade elements on the biopsy, things like that? Um, definitely sending one of these tests. It's nice that we have more ways to give someone information so they feel like they're making the best 
educated decision. So I'd say more information is always better, you know. Hashtag save the mail. Save the mail, woo! Close, close. Uh, Dr. Lowe, thank you so much. And I just want to say I love the background with the shoe, the high heel shoe on your ledge over there. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in your office, but <laughs> can you see it? <laughs> that's that's the tape dispenser. Oh, is it? Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, Stacy, thank you so much for joining us. And um, you know, we have been having some internet problems, but you are live. But we're gonna get it cut and edited in a few days up there. But um, thank you so much for being our local driver. You're at NYU, and she has her own radio show on Sirius XM on Men's Health Radio. Um, and thank you so much. I am your biggest fan and uh, look forward to you following us in our journey. Good luck Hopefully with the drive. Yes, thank you. And if you're um, near TV, uh, CBS2 um, is talking about men's health and the drive at 5.45. So Dr. Max Goldman is a little piece. But, but we're very blessed to have um, drivers and partners like you to help us you know, advocate for men everywhere. So Stacy, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 We'll Bye, Stacy. So, right now, we just want to free some people out and have some fun. Kind of like the camaraderie, you know, a bunch of guys in the army, you got to do cool stuff. So, uh, we're going to pull.